thank you everybody for coming and a particularly thank you to Professor Matsushita for this excellent overview over the challenges of the climate crisis and options to address this crisis. So what I'm going to do now in the next 15 minutes is to zoom in, uh, talking about uh, the climate crisis and the issues of conflict and peace in a specific uh, geopolitical context, namely the Pacific Island, Island countries. So uh, this is what I'll try to cover in 15 minutes. Let's see how, how we go. Uh, but just first, um, give you a little bit of what G Give you a little bit of uh, of uh, background and context. So we started uh, this work stream on climate change and conflict in the Pacific in 2018 with the Toda Peace Institute, and uh, we had a series of workshops dealing with these uh, issues. And the guiding document for our work is uh, the TODA Pacific Declaration on Climate Change, Conflict and Peace, which emerged out of the first international workshop that we had in 2018. And we do this work in collaboration with partners in Pacific Island countries, peace building organizations and other civil society organizations, and we have them as a network in this uh, TODA Climate Change Steering Committee. So this is uh, the context in which uh, we did our, our research. So um, as you all know um, uh, that the Pacific Island countries are particularly hard hit by, by the climate, climate emergency. So they are really faced with truly existential threats there's even talks about total island states disappearing, inunda being inundated uh, or becoming uninhabitable. So you all know about several sea level rise or the intensification uh, in the frequency and intensity of, of uh, cyclones uh, and other, uh, other environmental effects of climate change. Uh, the challenge for the Pacific Island countries is that uh, they uh, have to suffer from a combination of extreme exposure and constrained options uh, for adaptation. And this <coughs> makes them highly, highly vir uh, vulnerable. Um, so, and these environmental effects have social, economic, political implications that are conflict prone. So uh, when you have issues like sea level rise or coastal erosion, then uh, this impacts on land security, water security, livelihood security, habitat security. And uh, these uh, then uh, translate into risks to, to food security, uh, to health and infrastructure, and also to what we've called ontological or relational security, and I'll come back to that, that later. But the combination of all these factors have led the leaders of the Pacific Island countries, which come together in the Pacific Island Forum, to say in their BOE declaration of 2018 that climate change, I quote, is the greatest single threat to the livelihoods security and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific. So this is the view of, of the leaders of these Pacific Island countries. Um, what we are looking at, particularly in the context of our TODA work, is the relationship between climate change and human mobility. Because in the Pacific Island uh, countries, there are only limited options for in situ adaptation. So people try to build sea walls or plant mangroves to protect their islands. Uh, but this often is technically not feasible or very costly or only uh, is, is possible for a certain amount of time and then the sea walls collapse again. So uh, this means that mobility is another option of adaptation or at least an 
uh, adaptation measure of, of last resort. And in the Pacific, uh, people and leaders are caught between the desire to stay put and the need to migrate or to plan uh, for relocation. Uh, and uh, this uh, relocation or this uh, mobility has different forms. So you have a lot of in-country individual or family migration, mostly from rural areas to the few urban centers or from outer islands to, to main islands. You also have a lot of international migration at the individual and family level to Pacific Rim countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, the US, and I think also to a certain extent to Japan. And more and more you have relocation of entire communities within a country, so villages at the coast or in river plains uh, that are challenged uh, by, by sea level rise have to relocate further inland or higher, higher up. And of course you have forced displacement in the wake of natural disasters. And all these different types of climate-induced migration are also uh, in different ways prone to, to conflict and even violent escalation of, of conflict. Um, I skip the case studies that I had prepared because I think time will not suffice. Uh, but um, to generalize is we have to take uh, we, we have to make uh, very clear that there are no climate wars in the Pacific or in other parts of the world, neither interstate nor intrastate. But what we do have is everyday uh, dispersed violence or violent conflict in the local contact, uh, context. And this is often small scale, low intensity, but nevertheless devastating for the people uh, who are affected by it. So you have, for instance, intergroup conflicts between communities and urban centers due to in-migration. When people from different islands come and are squeezed together in the informal squatter settlements of the urban centers, then often they clash over access to resources, over job opportunities, and so forth. And you also have um, conflicts between communities in uh, an, a rural setting uh, over uh, scarce resources like water or land that's becoming more scarce because of the effects of, of climate change. And you have uh, conflicts between settlers and recipient communities. So if one community is forced to leave its own land and go to the land of another community, then often they clash over access to, to land, fishing rights, and things like that. And as I said, these are conflicts over scarce resources or access to public goods. And not to forget that there are also conflicts uh, between communities that, for instance, have to relocate and state institutions, because often the state institutions pursue a top-down approach and not really include the communities in the planning and in the implementation of, uh, of relocation. And so you also have these conflicts. So it would be um, mistaken to think of the state as the good guy who provides uh, the, the solutions. Um, What's important to also know, uh, to note is that there are no direct causal links between climate change and violent conflict. Cl the climate crisis, the climate emergency is, uh, and this is the, the parlance of, uh, in, in the international academic uh, world, a threat multiplier or a risk multiplier. And it's important to note that context matters and that violent conflict is more likely to escalate in fragile situations, uh, so where state institutions, for instance, are weak or not, not trusted. So you have this climate fragility conflict link, or in contexts that are already conflict prone or have experienced violent conflict before, where there's a lack of institutional and adaptive, adaptive capacity 
and a lack of legitimacy and effectiveness of institutions of governance, in particular state institutions. And uh, not to forget also that the climate crisis is also uh, the basis for structural, cultural, epistemological violence. So it's not only the direct violent conflict uh, between communities or in the everyday uh, context of, of uh, squatter settlements, but livelihood loss, disease, food and water insecurity. Uh, so the effects of climate ch uh, change can be seen as structural violence, and they are often more immediate and more pressing threats to people's life than the danger of armed, armed conflict. And so is the cultural and epistemological violence that comes uh, with uh, the effects of climate change. For instance, uh, the uh, loss of connection to land and the loss of uh, knowledge linked to place. So how, how to, to address these challenges? So we use uh, this metaphor of weaving the mat, which is a very uh, specific metaphor, bringing together different actors, factors, in uh, uh, the, the, the attempt uh, to, de uh, to deal with these challenges. Uh, and this means, first and foremost, to acknowledge the hybridity of governance in environments like the Pacific Island co uh, countries. So governance um, is crucial to deal uh, with the effects of climate change, and governance in these countries is hybrid, meaning that not only state institutions are in charge of governing the society and the communities, but also traditional authorities, like chiefs, elders, healers, tribal leaders, and civil society organizations. In the Pacific, it's particularly in the churches, because the churches by far are the most important um, civil society organizations. And they are also capable of addressing the cultural, spiritual dimension of the problem. And this is something that is often totally underestimated or marginalized by people, who researchers or policymakers, who come from a so-called secular Western uh, enlightened background. And what we again and again found in the Pacific is the importance of the connection between land and, and people. And this is expressed, for instance, in the languages of Pacific Island countries. The term Vanua in Fijian, for instance, means land and people at the same time. So land and people are one. Or there's this tradition of burying the umbilical cord of a newborn baby in the land of the community to express the connection between people and land. And this is why relocation or migration or displacement is such a threat to these people because they lose the connection uh, to the land. And this is what uh, we have called ontological security, so security that is in place. It's a totally different understanding of security as in international relations, for instance, but it matters for the people on the ground. So um, our Pacific colleagues talk about this um, as eco-relationality. So they uh, say we have to have, have to take into account the interconnectedness. And they talk about a whole of life approach. Uh, and this is also what we uh, have uh, put into our TODA Pacific Declaration. It's necessary to overcome human-centered approaches which separate people from nature. It's necessary to acknowledge the connections between people and other living beings and the material and immaterial worlds. So what we need is a non-anthropocentric, eco-relational approach to climate change, conflict, and peace building. And this goes even beyond this very progressive concept of human security because human security still focuses on human, be human beings as in isolation from other than human beings and in isolation from, from nature. Uh, so uh, 
what is necessary is, a, in a way, transcending Western ways of thinking and doing. We need dialogue across cultural difference. Uh, I, my time is up, I, I'm told. So you have the, the slides, the conclusions and the recommendations just basically repeat what I've said anyway. So have a, have a look at it. And uh, if you like, have a look at uh, the TODA website. Uh, there you can find the TODA Pacific Declaration. You can find our to uh, policy brief series, which mainly addresses issues of climate change and peace and conflict in the Pacific. And the Global Outlook blog uh, also has pieces on that. And uh, more recently, we also have these public conversations, these interviews on, on YouTube. Thank you very much. I have a question to both Dr. Volker Berge and uh, Professor Kazuo Matsushita, which is with regards to the Climate Change Related Losses and Damages Fund, um, which was announced um, after COPS 27. This was considered an extremely innovative and historical development, but I have a question related to um, what Dr. Berger mentioned um, with regards to loss of land. You mentioned that uh, the Pacific people's connection to the land is critical. It's critical to their sense of security, cultural security, to their sense of ontological security. But this kind of loss, <laughs> cultural loss, you know, indigenous knowledge loss cannot be quantified easily. So I was wondering how this fund, you know, is going to deal with such unquantifiable, non-economic, tangible losses that these um, climate change migrants will eventually face. Yeah, very, very briefly, as Professor Matsushita said, it was really a breakthrough that loss and damage now is has in principle been decided on in Sharm el Sheikh. Um, but on the other hand, one has to take into account what Ria said that it's difficult to really assess non economic loss and damage. So we have to think of land not only as a physical material reality, but for these people it is imbued with cultural, spiritual meaning, uh, traditional knowledge is linked uh, to land, and so you can't really uh, try to give money for, for that. Uh, that will be a challenge, uh, which does not mean one should let the main emitting uh, uh, developed nations off the hook. Of course, they have a responsibility uh, to put money into this, this fund to help uh, the developing countries, and particularly in the small island countries in the Pacific and elsewhere, uh, to uh, to adapt to the effects of climate change, but one has to take into account that this does not really solve uh, the overall all problem. It addresses part of the problem, namely the direct physical economic uh, dimension, but it cannot address uh, the cultural spiritual dimension of it. And uh, we have to uh, then think about, for instance, uh, climate mobility, which so far always has been uh, framed as an issue of adaptation, also as an issue of loss and damage, which would also then mean to have a different pr approach, uh, approach to, to climate-induced uh, relocation, for instance. But this is a big challenge, and at the end of the day, only trying to make it possible for these people to stay where they are and to avoid loss and damage, which means massive mitigation measures uh, can actually address this issue. And Professor Matsushita had in his presentation presented some options uh, how this could be done.